This live presentation was produced in Ashland, Oregon by the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library and Event Center. RVML relies on the support of our volunteers, members, and donors to organize and present these programs. For more information about this presentation or to borrow, download, or purchase other recordings from our catalog, please visit our website at rvml.org. Wow. So many friends. You know, we've, those of us that live in the outside world, that's outside of Ashland, uh, think of this as this kind of mythic place. Um, I was just sitting here thinking, in, uh, in my younger days, uh, I went to a music camp down at Stockton, and we did a musical production of Brigadoon, this fan fan fanciful city in the clouds where everything was just beautiful. And I think I've arrived in Brigadoon here. <laughs> you know, you can tell a lot about a community just driving down the main street. And so many of our main streets have been devastated. But here in Ashland, it's lively, populated with local independent businesses. And you can just begin to get a feel this is a very special place and you certainly must do everything in your power to protect it from the corporate predators. But I also, it's, you can tell a lot by an event like this. You know, some communities you go to and people start wandering in for the presentation and one sits in one corner, another sits in another corner, and they sit there real quietly waiting for somebody to do something. Now you notice it's very different here, at least I noticed. <laughs> People pouring in, coming right down to the front, engaging in lively smiles and conversation and hugs and all of that. And it's pretty clear this is indeed a special place with a great sense of community. And uh, I want to thank the, uh, your special metaphysical library and all the co-sponsors for this, and particularly uh, Bill Kauth, my good friend, and the, uh, the new warriors of the Mankind Project. I just want to see how many new warriors do we have here? <clears throat> wow. Oh, boy. <clears throat> that is an amazing program. And it's also, I consider it a great privilege to be the, uh, the warm act, warm up act tonight for my good friend and colleague Sharif, who will be speaking tomorrow night. Um, and definitely do not miss that. Sharif and I have been working together for many years. He was one of the, one of the founders of Yes Magazine and on our original board. An extraordinary man. Now, we're going to turn to our topic. This is a little booming. I may be. Uh, don't pull it away. It's very sensitive. You don't need to be very close. Okay. It also looks like somebody has taken off the windscreen. Is that true? There's no windscreen on this mic, yeah. Okay, I don't know what that is. Okay. Well, I expect I'm not the only one who, here who's learned that. Those of us who work for a progressive vision of a world that works for all often find ourselves somewhat divided and fragmented in our efforts, dealing with one insult to our lives and community and environment after another. And we're beginning to wake up to realize that we've got to move beyond that. We've got to come forward with a more proactive, coherent vision. And one way I think about it is also is, you know, instead of pulling the babies out of the river one by one downstream, we got to look upstream to find out who's, who's throwing them in. <laughs> and I'm hoping that my comments tonight will help to provide that larger framing vision to to bring us increasingly together around the great agenda of our time. The underlying message of the great turning, which is the focus of my comments tonight, is clear and simple. We humans have come to the end of a long and deeply destructive era, and it is time to turn this world around for the sake of ourselves and the sake of our children for generations to come. Now, the moment that many of us have been anticipating for a long time, the moment when our species comes dead up 
against a confrontation with the limits of the planet. It's no longer a future event. It's right now. We are into it. And we're seeing the consequences in a combination of peak oil, climate change, collapsing U.S. dollar, and the social breakdown that's born of the exclusion of a majority of the world's people, what is really behind the violence and the terrorism that uh, has become such a threat. Now, these forces, as these forces are converging, they are poised to bring a dramatic restructuring of every aspect of human life. It is not, you know, we cannot avoid deep change, but the question is how will that deep change play out? Will this play out as a terminal human crisis or as an epic human opportunity? And our job is to turn it into an opportunity. Now how it plays out, I believe, will depend very much on the stories by which we understand what's happening and understand the choices that it is ours to make. Now I find hope in this and the fact that people throughout the United States and the world are meeting in dialogue to take a fresh look at the old stories that no longer serve us. A particular discussion may focus on climate change, racism, peace, democracy, spiritual renewal, peak oil, economic justice, any of these related topics. I call them earth community dialogues because they all converge on the same imperative. The imperative to create communities of place that recognize the interdependence of all life. Now, uh, Bill gave you a bit of a review of my personal history. I, I'll give you just a, a slightly different cut on that, which I find is very useful in, uh, in helping to frame uh, how, how I got to the conclusions of the Great Turning. But first, I have a question. How many in the room here are over 60 years old? Okay, we're well represented. That's, that's, uh, that's my generation. <laughs> And as those of you who raised your hands know, members of our generation have lived through an extraordinary shrinking of geographical space and expansion of intercultural communication. These changes reflect a fundamental change in the human condition that has spurred an awakening of a more holistic and inclusive human consciousness all around the planet and opens the way to an epic reordering of human relationships with one another and with Earth. And my life is a particularly dramatic example of this human transition. I grew up in a small conservative town up north. I suppose many here know Longview, Washington. That was, that was the home of my birth and growing up. And when I was growing up in that town, I rarely saw a person of a different race. I never met a Muslim, Hindu, or Buddhist. Um, yeah, I will need to see my notes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I say I never, I never met a Muslim, Hindu, or Buddhist. Uh, the most exotic people in our town were. Uh, are we get this worked out, or? Okay. Anyhow, the the most exotic people in our town were Catholics. And I, you know, I assumed this is where I was going to spend my life uh, selling musical instruments and home appliances from the family store to other people that, uh, that looked and thought pretty much like me. And at that time, it was beyond imagination, as it would have been for many of you, I suspect had a similar experience, that as an adult, I would live for actually for 21 years outside of the United States in East Africa, Central America, and Southeast Asia, experiencing the wondrous diversity of the human species, our cultures, and forming close friendships that crossed every human barrier of race, nationality, uh, and religion. Now, the turning in my life began in 1959, which is Bill, Bill noted. That, well, I was actually a college senior at Stanford, uh, not at Harvard, <laughs> so my, here on the West Coast. And I was very concerned about these communist revolutions and uh, signed up for this course and learned that these revolutions are uh, indeed born of the frustrations of poverty. And it was that point I decided to devote my life to ending, contributing to ending global poverty by bringing the secrets of US business success to people around the world so they could become free, happy consumers like us. <laughs> 
Now, I was kind of a slow learner. It took me about 30 years to figure out <laughs> that the economic models that were favored by the organizations for which I worked were actually producing devastating consequences everywhere they touch for people and planet. And I set myself to trying to understand why. And in hindsight, the reasons are quite clear and it's quite simple. The favored economic models called for decision making based on maximizing short term returns to money rather than on maximizing the well long term well being of people and planet. And the more ex deeply I examined the issues, the clearer it became that those models primarily favor the interests of wealthy people in a position to profit from global corporations and financial markets. You know, it's really interesting how simple these things are once you kind of penetrate through the illusions of the, of the, uh, of the stories that uh, misguide our attention. If you focus on making decisions based on returns to money, what you're really doing is making decisions based on returns to people who have money. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how simple it is once you, <laughs> you know, it took, took me 30 years to figure that out, but you know, once you get it, <laughs> it kind of sticks with you. And eventually, um, some of our Asian colleagues uh, approached us and said, you know, we think you're finally learning what our real problem is. You came here to help us. If you really want to be helpful, go home and work on education in the United States. <laughs> so Fran and I moved uh, uh, in 1992 from the Philippines to New York City to focus our attention on the deeper roots of the problem. And it turns out we settled in an apartment on Union Square between Wall Street and Madison Avenue. <laughs> And that proved quite an inspiring location for writing when corporations rule the world. <laughs> and this book, of course, helped to frame the global resistance against corporate globalization and led to my deep involvement in the emergence of global civil society and, uh, uh, that, that formed around that set of issues. And I'll say more about global civil society later. Then on September 11, 2001, terrorists attacked the United States and our government announced its intention to use the full force of the U.S. military to impose order on the world and secure U.S. interests. And it was then we began to hear increasing discussion about the merits and demerits of American empire. And as that played out, we began to grasp the impl implications. The veil was stripped away to reveal even more disturbing truths about the state of humankind, democracy, and the reality behind the idealized vision of U.S. democracy and global benevolence. And by its response to 9-11, the US administration opened our eyes to the reality that the devastating dysfunctions of corporate rule are in fact but an extension by other means of 5,000 years of domination by naked military force in the cause of empire. And to address this larger challenge, it, we became aware that global civil society needed a larger analytical framework, a larger framework for understanding the nature of what we were up against and the nature of the changes we needed to bring into being. And my drive to understand the issues involved has drawn me into a deep examination of this broad sweep of the human experience, our understanding of our human nature and our understanding of our human place in creation. The Great Turning from Empire to Earth Community is my report on this exploration, and I hope that it will help to frame the work of bringing an end to empire and the birthing of a new era of Earth community. Now, the book begins with these prophetic opening words from the Earth Charter. We stand at a critical moment in Earth's history, a time when humanity must choose its future. We stand at a critical moment in Earth's history, a time when humanity must choose its future. To move forward, we must recognize that in the midst of a magnificent diversity of cultures and life forms, we are one human family and one Earth community with a common destiny. So what's this choice? The choice before us is between two contrasting models for organizing human affairs. One is the dominator model of empire and the other is the partnership model of Earth community. And I believe that absent an understanding of the deeper history and implications of this choice, we humans might well squander valuable time and resources on efforts to preserve or mend cultures and institutions that cannot be fixed and must be replaced. I expect that many of you here are familiar with the work of cultural historian Rianne Eisler, 
and the chalice and the blade. <coughs> yeah. Hey, yeah, let's have some applause for the <laughs> As many of you will recognize, I've actually built the book on her, her basic framework. Rianne observes that for hundreds of thousands of years before the onset of empire, humans evolved within a cultural and institutional frame of earth community, expressed here in symbolic representation by the Stonehenge Circle of Life. These early ancestors worshiped the goddess, balanced feminine and masculine energies, and placed women in significant leadership roles. Generally peaceful and egalitarian, these early societies organized not to dominate life, but to celebrate it. It was a time of extraordinary creative progress in discovering and cultivating the capabilities and technologies that make us distinctively human. These include the arts of spoken language, oral literature, settled agriculture, textile weaving, clothing production, metallurgy, town planning, architecture, building and highway construction, and the institutions of law, government, and religion. All of this is largely ignored by those historians who would have us believe that human civilization began with the beginning of empire. And it would have us believe that war and empire are essential conditions of human progress. Here's one of our first introductions in this presentation to the stories that distort our understanding of our history and our possibility. It was some 5,000 years ago that our ancestors made a tragic turn from the partnership of Earth community to the domination of empire symbolized here by the Egyptian pyramids of power. And as this played out, female gods were replaced by male gods, and we humans lost our sense of attachment to Earth as the masculine drove out the feminine and men took over to rule by bow and sword. The resulting brutal competition for power created a relentless play or die, rule or be ruled dynamic of violence and oppression. As conquest became the measure of human greatness and our societies became divided between the rulers and the ruled as relationships at all levels from those between among nations to those amongst uh, family members came to be organized by dominator hierarchy. In the process of this, whole groups of people were eliminated from the competition for power and privilege by denying their humanity. And I'm sure that many of you in this room re recall that within the lifetime of my generation, there was a serious debate as to whether women and people of color actually have human souls. This is a mark of how recently we have become, begun to emerge from this darkness. And of course, women and, color, women and people of color have come forward to tell us in no uncertain terms that they do damn well indeed have human souls. <laughs> and they're, they're coming forward to lead us to a new human era. There are many things that were stunning to me as I reviewed the history in writing this book. And one was, that every time I came across discussion of an empire's economy, there was somehow a mention of slavery as a foundation of that economy. Now again, it's one of these things, as you begin to put the pieces together, it becomes clear it's no coincidence that every, every empire in history has been built on a foundation of slavery. It's axiomatic. If you're gonna create societies with a few people on top, then most people are gonna be on the bottom and some are gonna be very, very far down on the bottom and sweatshop and migrant agricultural workers are our modern equivalents. Thus it has been for five millennia, the vast majority of humans have been reduced to conditions of servitude that deny their rights and suppress their creative potential, as at the same time the most power-driven and ethically challenged among us have often been the ones elevated to the highest positions of power. Now I'll not waste time mentioning any names, but perhaps some might come to your minds. <coughs> To maintain this crime against humanity, the agents of empire have, through these five millennia, diverted a major portion of the resources available to human societies away from meeting basic needs of people and nature in order to support the military forces, prisons, palaces, temples, retainers, and propagandists required to maintain the system of domination. And any of you who have seen these charts comparing our military budget currently with our social budgets know that this pattern continues strong to this day. Now, as we begin to understand the dynamics of empire, it becomes abundantly clear that most all of the social dysfunctions of our time, including racism, sexism, environmental destruction, 
I'm sorry, I'm not keeping very close track here with the, uh, um, with the clicker. The, most of the serious uh, dysfunctions of our time, including racism, sexism, environmental destruction, crime, war, and poverty, are all consequences of the inexorable rule or be ruled competitive dynamic of empire. And they will be with us for so long as we allow imperial cultures and institutions to define our values and relationships. Negotiating this transition requires progressive groups come together in common cause. On a crowded planet, peace, sustainability, justice, and equity are all inseparably linked. The time to choose a different path is now at hand because empire has reached the limits of exploitation that people and planet will tolerate. If we continue with business as usual, future generations will look back and refer to our time as the great unraveling, a time of environmental and social collapse. Now, fortunately, it is within our means to move beyond empire, to give birth to a new era of Earth community based on a more mature understanding of our responsibilities to one another and to Earth. Buddhist spiritual teacher Joanna Macy suggests that if we are successful in navigating this transition, future generations may speak of this as the time of the great turning, the time when humanity turned from the way of domination and embraced the way of partnership. As many of you know, it was Joanna Macy who popularized the term, the great turning, and uh, much to my joy, gave me permission to use it for the title of this book. <laughs> I, I might note that, that when I asked Joanna about this, she said, I'd love to have you use the title for the book because we want this to be a public term owned by everyone, not associated with any particular individual. So feel, please feel free to use it without reference <laughs> to, uh, to anyone. Now, <clears throat> over the millennia, the primary institutional form of empire has morphed from the imperial city-states of ancient time to the imperial nation-states of the modern era, and more recently to the imperial global corporations that now have more power than most nation-states. But throughout this period of morphing institutions, the pattern of domination and exclusion has remained largely unchanged. Now, occasionally someone will ask me, why are you so obsessed about corporations? Aren't they just communities of people? Well, this argument misses a critical point. There are, of course, many wonderful ethical people working in corporations trying to do the right thing. But the key reality is that a publicly traded corporation the people are all employees of the institution with few, if any, individual rights. They are paid to serve the institution at its pleasure, required to leave their personal values at the door, and subject to arbitrary dismissal without recourse at a moment's notice. These, of course, are not qualities that we normally associate with community. We're talking here about an institution of enormous power governed by absentee owners and unaccountable managers in the business of converting the life energy of people and nature into money for the short-term financial gain of already wealthy shareholders and managers without regard to human or natural consequences. <laughs> we have a name. <laughs> we have a name for this pattern. The publicly traded limited liability corporation is best known as a gigantic pool of money with an artificial legal personality required by law to behave like a sociopath. <laughs> <laughs> PR image as a side is a destroyer of community and a powerful engine of wealth concentration in a world in desperate need of community and equity. And it has no place in a just and sustainable society. Now I want to turn to another dimension of the great unraveling, another one of the misleading stories. Modern societies have for more than 50 years defined progress in terms of economic growth. And we've been highly successful at growing our economies. Since 1950, global economic output has increased by some seven times. And this has made a great deal of money for a few people at an extraordinary cost. 
here's an indicator that tells a very different story. <clears throat> it's the Living Planet Index. <clears throat> Living Planet Index is a measure of the health of the world's freshwater, ocean, and forest ecosystems. This, accord is, of course, is the life support system of the planet and arguably the foundation of all real wealth. Now, it's not particularly esoteric. You don't need a PhD in economics to grasp this. In fact, you probably have an easier time grasping it if you don't have a PhD in <laughs> economics. <laughs> but here's the, simple, here's the simple point. If there's no life support system, there's no life. And if there's no life, the whole concept of wealth totally loses any meaning. <laughs> now, this index has declined by 37% in the past 30 years, which means that in spite of what GDP growth is telling us, we are as a species growing steadily poorer. Now, the good news, at least from the standpoint of the planet, is that the species that bears responsibility for this devastation will be gone long before the index reaches zero. Here's another piece of the picture. About 85% of what remains of the planet's life support system is currently expropriated by the more fortunate 20% of the world's people to support often extravagantly wasteful lifestyles. Meanwhile, the poorest 20% struggle for survival on slightly more than 1%, and the middle 60% get by on roughly 14%. Now, one of the many lessons that I learned during my years abroad was that much of what we call development is in fact a process of appropriating the land and water resources on which the bottom 80% of people depend for their livelihoods in order to make way for dams, mines, shrimp farms, agricultural estates, golf courses, suburban sprawl, shopping centers, whatever, that primarily benefit the already most fortunate 20%. To put it in simple language, Conventional economic growth indicators measure the rate at which the productive resources of the poor are being expropriated by the rich and converted to garbage. And we call it progress. It's a process driven by the insatiable demands of a rising stock market which inflates the financial assets of the rich to increase their claims against the remaining usable wealth of the planet relative to the claims of people who live from returns to their labor. The result is an accelerating environmental devastation and economic inequality. So the day of reckoning for our reckless ways is now at hand. <clears throat> As we face the mounting forces of a perfect economic storm born of a convergence of peak oil, climate change, and a meltdown of the US dollar. Now peak oil, as I'm sure most of you know by now, occurs when global oil production peaks it begins its inexorable decline. While global demand continues to rise, sending prices soaring to the sky. Now some experts tell us that by the best estimates, peak oil production peaked last year in 2005. Other, es other experts estimate it will not happen for another 10, 25, or even 35 years. Fortune magazine notes quite correctly that that difference is irrelevant. The era of cheap oil is over, and we must end our dependence on oil. Now here quickly are some of the implications for how our way of life will change. <clears throat> Long haul transport and global supply chains, the backbone of the corporate global economy, soon to become relics of a dying era. Auto-dependent suburbia, strip malls, shopping centers, and box stores like Walmart located in the middle of nowhere. Candidates for going out of business sales. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Let that be the one and only time you shop at Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> Oil-dependent industrial agriculture, running out of gas. It is our food supply. <laughs> now take a very close look here. Do you see any oil dependence here? <laughs> These, of course, are the oil guzzling military plane ships and ground vehicles we depend on to secure our access to cheap oil. They're becoming increasingly unaffordable, and as demonstrated most recently in Afghanistan and Iraq, they are wholly ineffective against current security threats. We would do best on all fronts to get rid of them. 
Now, as oil prices inexorably rise, much of our existing capital stock will be reduced to useless stranded assets, including much of the supporting infrastructure of our sprawling and unsustainable suburbs. Options for converting existing automobiles to other power sources may be limited, although this is one biofuel prototype currently under testing. <laughs> Now, the consequences of peak oil will be exacerbated by climate change. During the 20th century, the average mean surface temperature of the planet increased by 0.6 degrees Celsius. Projections of the increase anticipated by the end of the current century range from 2 degrees to 4.5 degrees Celsius. And we are, of course, already experiencing an ominous trend in weather-related natural disasters. From the decade of the 1950s to the first five years of the 21st century, within the lifetimes of many of us in this room. The annual average of weather-related natural disasters increased from 24 per year to 350 per year. Hurricanes Katrina and Rita are but a foretaste of what lies ahead. According to a study commissioned by the U.S. Department of Defense, we can expect shorter growing seasons and a 10 to 25 percent global loss of crop yield. Water shortages. Increase in forest fires, famine, disease, and severe weather events, endemic resource wars, and uncontrolled migration. The threat of terrorism pales by comparison. The third, the third element of the perfect economic storm, the meltdown of the U.S. dollar, is a consequence of a growing U.S. trade deficit that hit three quarters of a trillion dollars in 2005, as empty shipping containers accumulate in our busy ports. A growth in the trade gap between what we import and what we export is a measure of the extent to which we in the United States are living beyond our own means, running up a credit card debt to the rest of the world, and leaving the bill to our children. It is also a measure of the rate at which we are hemorrhaging both the family wage jobs that created the U.S. middle class and the manufacturing technology and research capabilities that go with those jobs. And of course, on the day the rest of the world tires of selling on credit to an economic deadbeat, the financial house of cards that supports our profligate ways will come tumbling down. <clears throat> and if we choose to play out the great unraveling by the stories of empire as a last man standing competition for the remaining resources of the planet, we can anticipate escalating military conflict and terrorism leading to feudal fragmentation as after the fall of the Roman Empire and possible nuclear Armageddon. Fortunately, there is an alternative, and I expect by now you're ready to hear me talk about it. <laughs> now, the good news comes out of the bad news. The perfect economic storm now upon us will force a dramatic restructuring of the way we live as the economic incentives shift from global to local supply chains and from suburban sprawl to compact communities that bring home, work, and recreation in easy reach by foot, bicycle, and public transit. And as these forces play out, the communities that fare best will be those that act now to rebuild local supply chains, reverse the trend toward conversion of farm and forest lands, concentrate population in urban cores, support local low-input family farms, and seek to become substantially self-reliant in food and energy. So you can see here the way in which the imperative thus becomes an opportunity to rebuild functioning communities, restore a sense of place, democratize economic power, and radically revise our priorities for the use of labor, land, and other natural resources. Now I want to turn uh, to a story by one of my favorite biologists. It's the story of the metamorphosis of the caterpillar to the butterfly, as told by evolution biologist Elizabeth Satoris. <clears throat> I believe it provides a helpful metaphor for the human turning from empire to earth community. The caterpillar is a voracious consumer that devotes its life to gorging on nature's bounty. When it's had its fill, it fastens itself to a convenient twig and wraps itself in a chrysalis to take a rest. Once snug inside, however, crisis strikes. As the structures of its cellular tissue begin to dissolve into an organic soup. Now note, this represents disaster from the perspective of the caterpillar's lower worm nature. 
It represents opportunity from the perspective of the caterpillar's higher butterfly nature. <coughs> now, guided by some deep inner wisdom, as this occurs, a number of what scientists call organizer cells. I want you to repeat that with me. Organizer cells. Good, you got it the first time. These organizer cells begin to rush around, gathering other cells into imaginal buds, which are multicellular structures that begin to give form to the crucial organs of a new creature. Now, as this plays out, what remains of the caterpillar's immune system perceive a threat to the old order. And the immune system attacks the imaginal buds as alien intruders. But the organizer cells and imaginal buds ultimately prevail by linking up with one another <clears throat> in a cooperative emergent process that gives birth to a new creature of extraordinary beauty that lives lightly on the earth, serves the regeneration of life by pollinating flowers, and in its rebirth has the capacity to traverse vast expanses of the North American continent to experience life's possibilities in ways the earthbound caterpillar could scarcely have imagined. As our familiar institutional structures disintegrate around us, we humans stand on the threshold of a rebirth no less dramatic. The transformation of the caterpillar is physical. Ours, if we are successful, will be cultural and spiritual. And whereas the caterpillar faces an outcome preordained by the experience of countless generations before and embedded in its genetic structure, we humans are path-breaking pioneers in uncharted territory, and our success depends on exercising our human capacity for conscious, creative choice. Here is one of these extraordinary coincidences. Fortunately, we humans have achieved the means to assume collective responsibility for our future at the precise moment we have encountered the imperative to do so. I take this as evidence that creation is intelligent, compassionate, and wants the human species to succeed. Consider, it was little more than 60 years ago that we created the United Nations, which for all its imperfections made it possible for the first time in the human experience for representatives of all the world's people to gather in a neutral location to settle their differences by dialogue rather than through force of arms. An extraordinary event. It was less than 50 years ago that we humans ventured into space to look back and see ourselves as one people sharing a common destiny on a living spaceship. Totally changed our perception of ourselves and our place in the cosmos. It was only within the last 10 to 15 years that our communications technologies gave us, for the first time, the ability, should we choose to use it, to link every human on the planet into a seamless web of nearly costless communication and cooperation. So extraordinary, this all happened in the span of a single lifetime. And our future will now be determined by how we choose as a species to use the capabilities that are now in our hands. Now, there are some problems. <clears throat> a few barriers. Unfortunately, our ability as a society to choose life is seriously hampered by the work of a small group of committed right-wing extremists who believe that the strength of America lies not in a strong middle class and vibrant local communities, but rather with a strong wealthy elite and the global projection of corporate and military power. These extremists claim to be conservative defenders of family values. Yeah. But they cut programs that benefit children, families, communities, and nature to finance tax cuts for the rich, subsidies to crony corporations, and wars of imperial domination and occupation that actively undermine peace, security, and democracy. Now consider, these acts are in fact wholly at odds with what most Americans consider to be conservative values, and they constitute a literal all-out war against our children, families, communities, and nature. This is one of the stories that we need to expose. We've let these guys spin, spin their travesty for too long. <clears throat> now, perhaps there's somebody here who might have at some time wondered how the self-serving champions of elite power and corporate greed have achieved the willing participation of so many among us 
in destroying the things that we most value. Has that question occurred to anybody here? Yeah. <clears throat> well, there is a simple but profound answer that I believe is the key to the turning. We humans live by the stories that define our values and our understanding of our relationships to one another and creation. Authentic cultural stories are told by authentic storytellers and artists engaged in interpreting the values and aspirations of authentic communities. Unfortunately, in our society, the storytelling function has too often been taken over by propagandists and advertisers on the payroll of imperial politicians and imperial corporations to create a cultural trance that blinds us to our higher possibilities. Just keep your eyes focused on the spinning circle there, folks. <coughs> This misdirection plays out in the prevailing stories that define the public discourse on prosperity, security, and meaning. <clears throat> now listen closely and consider how each of the following familiar stories reaffirm empire's relationships of domination. <clears throat> the imperial prosperity story says, Economic growth is a true measure of increasing prosperity and brings benefit to everyone. Economic growth requires wealthy investors who are able to finance the enterprises that create our jobs. And as investors seek to maximize their individual financial gain, the magical and visible hand of the market rewards each according to their contribution to the prosperity of all. So for the good of society, we must free wealthy people from the taxes and regulations that limit their ability to accumulate the substantial fortunes essential to our well-being. <laughs> we must also eliminate those terrible welfare programs that strip the poor of their motivation to be productive members of society, willing to work hard at whatever jobs the market offers and therefore hold them in poverty. <clears throat> I don't imagine anybody here has ever heard that story before, have you? <clears throat> Then there's the imperial security story. It tells of a dangerous world filled with criminals, terrorists, and foreign enemies. Our security depends on aggressive use of strong police and military forces to control and eliminate unruly elements. I bet somebody here has heard that story not too long ago. <laughs> now this, other, this next story, the meaning story, is a little difficult for some of us because it goes to the heart of some fundamental things that we have been taught for a very long time. And yet it is the foundation of the imperial stories and the imperial misrepresentation. The imperial meaning story tells of a god who commands us to go forth to establish dominion over the earth. The god who favors the righteous with wealth and power and who commissions his favor to rule over the poor who justly suffer divine punishment for their sins. We may not know what those sins were, but they must indeed have been horrendous. <laughs> Meaning is found in obedience to God and to his appointed representatives. Yeah. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> You'll notice the underlying pattern here. These imperial stories affirm the legitimacy of economic inequality, the use of physical force to impose the will of rulers, and the special righteousness of the rich and powerful. The wonderful thing is, as soon as the nature of these stories is pointed out, they lose their power and the trance is broken. Although it may seem absurdly simple, the key to changing the course of the human future is to change the stories by which we live. And it begins with finding the courage to break the silence and speak openly the truth in our hearts as we reach out to find one another and end our isolation by forming communities of congruence that link and grow so together we can speak with a clear and audible voice to change the prevailing cultural stories liberate the higher orders of human consciousness, and turn the human course. Now, contemporary scientific findings point to a profound yet elegantly simple insight that appropriately frames the new stories that is ours to tell. Relationships 
are the foundation of everything. Now, whereas Newtonian physics was based on a premise that only the material is real, the new quantum physics suggests that the material is in fact an illusion. Only relationships are real. The new biology teaches by the very nature of how life manages energy, life can exist only in cooperative living communities. And psychologists tell us that healthy relationships are the key to achieving a mature human consciousness. Put it together, here's what we find. True prosperity, security, and meaning are found in the life of just, vibrant, cooperatively interlinked communities that support every person in realizing their full creative potential. It is up to us to assume the role of organize ourselves engaged in the great work of forming the cultural and institutional imaginal buds of a new era of Earth community. It requires breaking free from the cultural trance of some of our most treasured stories. This next one is one that I had the hardest time coming to terms with, having grown up as a patriotic, loyal American. This is the story that the founding fathers of our nation acted out of a passionate belief in the right of every person to life, liberty, and justice, and gave us governing institutions that embody the highest expressions of the democratic ideal. Now, we do need to give credit where it's due. The founding fathers did make important groundbreaking contributions on the path to democracy. Specifically, they brought an end to hereditary monarchy and they introduced the separation of church and state to bring an end to theocracy. Beyond these two major contributions, however, much of our cherished national story is actually a self-limiting myth that serves elite interests by denying the need for continuing struggle in pursuit of the democratic ideal. Now, consider these well-known facts. Our Constitution was written by white male landowners. If you read it carefully within the context of its time, you will see that it was written to enshrine their power in the institutions of a plutocracy. That, of course, is a system of rule by people of wealth. And as we know, every inch of the land we occupy was taken by force and deceit from Native Americans. And much of that land was worked by slaves from, Af uh, from Africa. Women did not get the vote until 1920. <coughs> And even with the progress we've achieved through two centuries of popular struggle, daily events continue to demonstrate to anyone's paying attention that to our day, to this day, our nation is ruled as a plutocracy by people of wealth. And many of them are disdainful of the democratic ideal that ordinary people have both the right and the capacity to govern themselves. In the words of Francis Moore LePay, to save the democracy we thought we had, we must take democracy to where it has never been. Democracy is an unfinished project. Now the work of actualizing the democratic ideal calls us to bring forth the living economies, living democracies, and living cultures of a new era of Earth community. The success of this work will turn on our ability to displace the prevailing stories that affirm the dominator relationships of empire with stories that celebrate the higher order possibilities and potential of Earth community. <clears throat> Living economy stories celebrate life as the measure of true prosperity, and they call for the locally rooted equitable distribution of ownership rights to productive assets, to secure the right of every person to a secure and meaningful means of living. This is the core work of the economic turning, and it's based on a fundamental truth. If our children, families, communities, and natural systems are healthy, then we are prosperous. Whether conventional economic indicators, such as GDP or the Dow Jones average, rise or fall, should be irrelevant if we have a properly designed founded in 2000, now has 35 local networks and 11,000 members through the United States and Canada. 
to working together to grow, grow a new planetary system of local living economies free from the economic pathology of publicly traded corporations. This initiative is growing exponentially and may deserve There's hope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> living democracy stories. Celebrate active civic engagement grounded in a deep sense of mutual caring and responsibility. And these stories call for the fair and open political processes based on public financing of elections, instant runoff voting, and proportional representation. <laughs> and it would also be a very good idea to assure that every vote is counted. Yes. <laughs> it is our choice. Expanding the middle class and strengthening community increases prosperity, security, and liberty for all. Growing corporate profits and the financial assets of an elite ruling class increases the tyranny and insecurity of empire. The one advances democracy, the other advances plutocracy. Living culture stories. Celebrate the wonder and beauty of creation, life, and the creative potential of the human species. They nurture the higher orders of spiritual consciousness, and they call for turning the institutions of religion, education, and media to the service of free and authentic cultural expression in the service of creation's continued unfolding. This is the core of our cultural turning work. <clears throat> I find it one of the profound tragedies of Western civilization the we of Western culture have been conditioned by our religion stories to believe that we are fallen sinners incapable of goodness and unworthy of salvation except by divine grace. We have similarly been conditioned by science stories of Darwinian competition, selfish genes, and economic man to believe that it is our human nature to be individualistic competitors and profligate consumers. You'll note that by either reckoning, the idea that we humans might choose to live by the principles of Earth community would have to be dismissed as logically contrary to our nature. Of course, again, these stories that affirm empire by denying the positive potentials of our nature are false. Here we turn to psychologists who study the developmental pathway of the human consciousness and report that those of us who enjoy the requisite emotional support from family and community traverse throughout our lifetimes a pathway from the undifferentiated, instant gratification-seeking self-referential consciousness of the newborn to the highly differentiated, timeless, and inclusive spiritual consciousness of the wise elder. So what is our human nature? Our defining character is our capacity to choose. We are a choice-making species of many possibilities, and it is within our means to choose to cultivate the potentials of the spiritual consciousness that the cultures and institutions of empire deny. I've come to understand from my life experience that real meaning comes from approaching life as a journey of discovery, devoted to actualizing the higher possibilities of our nature, both our individual nature and our collective nature. And I find great excitement and great hope in the evidence that growing millions of people around the world are choosing this path. Indeed, millions are experiencing an awakening to the higher potentials of human consciousness. And it's so exciting that so many of you are gathered here right in this room. Now this awakening is most visibly manifest in a newly emergent social phenomenon we call global civil society. I think of it as a planetary scale, self-organizing social organism that transcends the barriers of race, class, religion, and nationality to act as a shared conscience of the species. Committed to a global vision of peace and justice, global civil society took form initially in opposition to the destructive consequences of corporate globalization. Then on February 15, 2003, it brought more than 10 million people to the streets of the world's cities and towns to oppose the violence of the planned U.S. invasion of Iraq. How many of you were part of that demonstration? Yeah, an amazing, an amazing event. Because it was such a phenomenal act of self-organization, 
totally unprecedented in the human experience. And of course, it could not have happened at any other time because it depended on the internet and the communication technologies now in our hand. So consider, it was accomplished without the benefit of any central organization. There was no operating budget. There was not even a charismatic leader standing up and saying, follow me to the streets. It was self-organized by literally millions of people acting as leaders on their own volition in support of deeply shared values and a shared vision of a world of peace and justice. It is but a foretaste of the truly democratic societies, free from the tyranny of dominator structures that it is ours to create. And at Yes Magazine, we call it a conspiracy of hope. <clears throat> well, at this point, I bet there's somebody out there who's been asking the question, what hope can there be for building a consensus commitment to Earth community in our politically divided nation? Does that question occur to anybody here? <laughs> here again, there's a hopeful answer. For all the talk of red states and blue states, US polling data reveal a restartling degree of consensus on many key issues, suggesting that the truth is we are more purple than we realize. <laughs> For example, a poll last December reported that 90% of us agree that big companies have too much power. Well, there's a start for an interesting conversation. 83% of us believe that as a society, the United States is focused on the wrong priorities. Hey. <laughs> Super majorities from many different polls report that more than 80% of us want to give higher priority to the needs of children, family, community, and the natural environment. Put it together and we can see that Americans want a world that puts people ahead of profits spiritual values ahead of financial values, and international cooperation ahead of international domination. Now I want you to note something about these values. None of these can be identified as distinctively conservative values or distinctively liberal values. They are deeply held, widely shared human values. We are in fact one nation yearning for healthy children, families, communities, and natural environments. And hopefully we can begin the conversation that helps us find this common ground. So let me see the hands again. Do you think business has, big business has too much power? <laughs> Anybody here think that as a nation we're focused on the wrong priorities? And how many here would like to see greater priority given to children, families, communities, and the natural environment? Wow. And I bet some of you came in here thinking that you were part of a fringe minority. <laughs> In fact, we are the leading edge of a national supermajority, and it is appropriate for us to speak and act accordingly with clarity and confidence. Hey! <clears throat> this is a defining moment. We humans face an unprecedented choice to give up the reckless ways of our species adolescence and accept responsibility for one another and Earth or continue on a path to collective suicide. And in its profound wisdom, the spiritual force of creation is calling us to take the step to a new level of species maturity. The new biology makes the case that the species that succeed and thrive are in fact not the most brutal and competitive. Rather, they are the species that find their place of service to the whole. And this is the challenge now before our species, to find our place of service in the larger scheme of creation. I think of it as a final examination to determine whether we are a species worthy of survival. The passing grade will require a sweeping cultural and institutional transformation. And as I'm sure many of you have noted, we waited our peril for the leadership in this great work to come from within the institutions of empire the institutions of the nation state, global corporations, or our national political parties. They are the equivalent of the caterpillar's immune system. By design, the institutions of empire serve the interests of elite power, but their time is passing. We are witnessing the violence of their death throes. The leadership in the great turning 
must come from people like us, acting as the organizer selves of a new era, working through our local governments, our local businesses, local unions, churches, educational institutions, and civic organizations to build vital democratic communities that serve as the imaginal buds of a new era. And this is why the work so many of you here are engaged in is so critically important. Wherever we live, we must each engage in the challenge of making our particular community of place an inspiring model of what can be for the nation and the world. And as we carry, out, carry forward our, experience, our experiments in communities around the nation and the world, we will learn, share, create, as we change the national conversation and ultimately turn the human course. In summary, break the silence, end the isolation, act through word and deed to break the trance, change the story, and turn this world around. Now, I hope you'll get a copy of The Great Turning and use it as a resource for personal study and for engaging your friends and colleagues in discussing the great work of our time. Think of it as a handbook, in part, for learning to identify the stories of empire on the path to breaking the cultural trance. And if you're involved in an organization with a progressive agenda, a social change mission, consider framing your mission in part in terms of the story and the larger society that you're working to change. It's a very powerful strategic focus because as we change the story, then everything else follows. Check out thegreatturning.net for group discussion guides and other helpful resources for engaging this work. And if by any possibility there is anyone here who is not already a YES subscriber, I urge you to act at once to correct this obvious deficiency in your life. We created YES to change the story that there is no alternative, and it's filled with inspiring stories, ideas, and resources for action. To know that there are millions of us out there working to change, working on deep change. Start a YES discussion circle. Find it all at yesmagazine.org. Our distinctive human capacity for reflection and intentional choice carries a corresponding moral responsibility to care for one another and the planet. And we must now test the limits of the individual and collective creative potential of the species as we strive to become the change we seek. And in these turbulent and often frightening times, it is important to regularly remind ourselves that we are in fact privileged to live at the most exciting moment of creative opportunity in the whole of the human experience. It is ours to choose our future. It is in our hands. Now is the hour. We have the power to turn this world around. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Thank you. I actually don't see any, con any, any conflict between Darwinian evolution and uh, the selfish gene in any of the uh, science that I know of, which I've studied extensively. And what you say here, which I agree with also, personally, I don't see there's a conflict if you look at it very deeply. Okay. I'd, like to, I'd like to hear more of what you, what you think about collapse whether it's inevitable, whether it's necessary for the turning that is coming. Mm -hmm. one yeah. Let's do one more and then... Uh... Uh, given the, the, the proven usefulness uh, to provide power to, uh, for terrorism to provide power to our administration and the corporate society, um, how how do you project that we're going to get through these changes when Bush has a Military Commission Act of 2006, et cetera, um, without some kind of major meltdown? Do you see that as being reality, or do you see that as being avertable? Mm -hmm. let's, start with the, let's start with the last one. I think, uh, as we saw in the last election, that uh, our country is beginning to wake up and beginning to withdraw power from the Bush administration. Um, if you actually get a copy of the book, you'll see that I've got a number of dedications in there, but the last dedication is to George W., who, uh, without his inspiration, I would not have written the book. <laughs> uh, 
you know, he's the one that drew our attention to the fact that what we're playing out here is an extension of, uh, of 5,000 years of empire, which helps us, you know, and I, I sometimes think, in fact, he was sent on a mission from God <laughs> to be <laughs> sufficiently extreme to wake us up to the reality that we have got to change deeply and that the, that the uh, leadership has to come from, from the people. And, you know, as you think about it, you understand the nature of the change that we need to navigate. Mm -hmm. The change has to come for the same processes, the same dynamics, the same kinds of relationships that we need to bring forth in the new era. And so it must come from us. And so part of this is waking up to the reality that we can't stand around waiting for the leader on the white horse or the savior to come and lead us to the province land. And discovering our own power is a key piece of it, and that's, that's how it's going to change. Is collapse inevitable, uh, or is it necessary for the change? Um, there's two things I want to point out. Um, one is, well, what are the, <laughs> two, two, thing, two things in mind that just slipped away. Um, okay, is it inevitable? I think part of this is a test of whether there is such a thing as human intelligence. <laughs> if in fact we're an intelligent species, we ought to be able to look out there and see what's coming down. And I think, I think that is shifting. I've, I've felt within the last year, a year and a half, there's been an enormous shift in our country in terms of awareness of, of the realities of peak oil, climate change, and you'll see in the business press a lot of talk about the, uh, the, 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 the trade gap and the dollar deficit, the foreign debt and that these are going to bring major changes. Um, now, our, our job is to get out there and people un help people understand the choices that this brings before us and how we need to, uh, to play this out. So I think it doesn't have, we, it, the collapse does not have to come in order to get, bring change. At the same time, part of what's deceptive about this is that you know, the nature of unraveling, you think of a piece of fabric, how does it unravel? The ravels around the margin. You know, that is a very instructive analogy. Because if you lived in New Orleans, you know, the collapse has already hit. You know, sitting here, we're still fairly comfortable, so we're sitting around waiting, well, when, when's it going to collapse? Well, and part of the danger here, of course, is that if it plays out by the rules of empire, by the rules of the market, you know, the people who will first experience falling off the edge will usually be the poorest people. And, you know, the, the, the remaining piece of the cloth will get smaller and smaller and smaller until we hit the, it hits the last few gated communities. Now, this is, again, part of the intelligence. We've got to, you know, we've got to recognize that, in fact, the collapse is already happening and not sit around waiting for it. Okay. Um, the question of conflict with Darwinian evolution, um, the speaker didn't do much elaboration. I, uh, uh, I, I think there, there's some very deep issues here. Um, it was part of a longer conversation. We're, uh, we're hearing regularly, I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen the, uh, you know, the discussions, recent Time Magazine on you know, the debate between again, creationism versus evolution. Now, I find this a very interesting debate. I mean, this, this goes to the heart of our creation stories. And of course, the, the, um, the creationism is based on the story along the lines of what I put up here in terms of the meaning story. And it brings to mind an image of, of God in the image, an anthropomorphic image of, uh, of an old guy with a gray beard. Of course, that particular painting was painted by an old guy with a gray beard, so that might tell us something. <laughs> um, but at a deeper level, it is about an external intelligence, an external designer. Now, by contrast, the, the evolution story is normally told by science as, as part of the larger story of creation. Still is caught up in this model of a dead universe in which every th all of creation can be explained by some combination of mechanical mechanism and blind chance. <clears throat> now, that actually comes from an underlying premise of the scientific method. 
you know, the scientific method is based on a premise that you can explain everything by, by mechanism, and that's, that has been a very powerful frame for science in its effort to discover deeper truths about our reality. But it's very unfortunate that many scientists have taken what is an assumption of the method and treat it as though it were a conclusion of science. Now, I happen, you know, and, and that model is based on a premise that life is purely a consequence, an accidental consequence of material complexity, and the consciousness is an illusion, and there is no intelligence in the universe. Now, I happen to believe that consciousness is real, <laughs> and that there is intelligence in the universe. And there's a lot of consciousness and intelligence sitting right here in this room. And to deny that I, to, strikes me as terribly unscientific. <laughs> and it's also tremendously disempowering. You know, many years, back when I was writing <clears throat> when corporations rule the world, and I was reflecting on the issues before us, particularly the the realization that we were on a collision course with our own self-destruction. I was struck by the number of times when I talked to people about this, they'd say, yeah, yeah, we're in real trouble. But you know, it'd be so expensive and so inconvenient to change. <laughs> and I came to realize survival alone is not a not sufficient reason for the change. We need a deeper source of, source of meaning. And part of what I've, you know, what I've come to is that our debate is framed by two self-limiting models. One, either the, the, the external creator or the dead world. Now, I'll bet you that most people in this room have a very different model. A model of the spirit, a spiritual, a unifying spiritual intelligence at the core of all creation. And that the whole process of creation is in fact a continuous unfolding as this spiritual intelligence seeks to know itself by becoming, by exploring and actualizing its possibilities. And you'll notice the extraordinary implications. I've been very, I've, I've, I've been very influenced by a, a Christian writer named uh, Marcus Bork, who has this remarkable observation. He says, tell me your image of God and I'll tell you your politics. <laughs> yeah. The external, the, 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 the stern father, the disciplinary God, sets up an order of righteousness and purity. And it is, it is the frame of the the, well, is the creation story for empire. And he, you know, many, many Christian philosophers suggest, or Christian scholars suggest that, uh, uh, you know, that it's a, it's a total distortion of the message of Jesus, who was supposedly the, the founder of the faith. That, that the idea that Jesus was in fact a mystic, who in fact was working from an understanding of the cosmos similar to what I think, what I suspect most people here who share. Now, if we're dealing in fact with a unifying spiritual consciousness, then that of course means that we are all united brothers and sisters with one another of all of humanity, as well as related to every plant, every stone, every grain of sand. <laughs> that all that is is a manifestation of this. And it has continued unfolding that we are here not as the end products of, of, of creation uh, with a mandate to destroy it and reverse that process of unfolding, but rather we are here as participants in that, and contributors to that continuing journey. And it is our place to find what is our creative contribution. And I suspect that it probably begins with creating just and sustainable human societies Earth, based on Earth community, in which we learn to live in creative, harmonious relationship with one another and the Earth. So this is this is the deeper level of that story, and uh, I thank you for that question. Stabilizing population growth, I think, is a hugely important issue. In the 1970s, my wife and I uh, devoted much of our professional attention to uh, management of family planning programs. Ultimately, we came to realize that 
the real key to stabilizing population had to be based on a universal uh, a move to greater equity and toward giving people a sense that they have actual control over their lives in many dimensions. And of course, also depends on bringing forth the, uh, uh, you know, bringing women to the fore, uh, empowerment, education, and a strong role in society. So, uh, those are those are my thoughts on the population issue. I have, um, you know, I also have a myriad of questions. I also have lived in Longview. Oh. The famous planned community in the yeah. shape of a wheel. Um, I, I'm a person that has done voluntary simplicity for years, mm -hmm. and it's given me a, a, put me in a spot. Uh, I don't have some of the energies that I once had when I was living by wealthier means, and sometimes I find myself invisible. Um, and I've learned to live with that. Right now I don't like it because I see the situation that's occurred and I want to do more than I'm capable of doing. I'm a baby boomer and I'm getting older and I don't have all the bennies. And I, I sometimes I feel angry and I know that there's a force in me to use my potential. And also I know that there's a lot of people that are homeless and young people that aren't getting the rights to their education. And sometimes their education is wrong. How do we change the public school system? And how do we honor elders that are getting older that need a voice and uh, don't have the, I don't, know, I don't know, the energy that they once had to, to go out and do everything. They just don't have the money to do it. And we don't need the money, we know. But we, we have the energy. And how in little communities like Ashland and bigger cities can we do something and to be sure that the children get their needs met and the elders get their needs met. And if we have an economic collapse, what is the most, I guess, the most profitable on a spiritual level that we can do for one another? That's my question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that one right now. <laughs> the answer to that question, we have to discover within our communities. I cannot give an answer. Next. I have a couple of comments. First of all, it is really heartening to me uh, to hear a male speaker of your dimension and research acknowledge as a source of a lot of your work uh, women who have come up with ideas and theories that you are grounding your work in and putting up visually to represent who they are. Uh, for me, as a feminist scholar and someone who just completed my doctorate in women's spirituality, I really want to laud you for that. Because the invisibility of women scholars is part of uh, part of what the suffering has been for, for lots of people. Actually, let, let me respond to that one right now also. Um, that's a very important point. You know, it's, it's perhaps a little risky to anthropomorphize empire, but it does appear that empire is very intelligent and it recognizes the conditions of its own survival. I think it's not by chance that women have been excluded throughout the period of empire because they are a threat to the empire stories and structure. And of course, this is one of the reasons for hope is that women are breaking out of that repression, finding their voice, and it is very often the women who are at the forefront of challenging these old, deeply embedded stories. And uh, it behooves us men to listen closely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. you have another question? I have another comment, and I'd like to hear kind of dialogue with you a bit about this. When you were using the example of Elizabeth Satoris about the caterpillar, mm -hmm. toward the end of that example, you said that this was on the part of the caterpillar to the butterfly, but primarily, um, a predominantly physical change. And our changes would be more about cultural and political. Cultural and really, spiritual. Cultural and spiritual. And as a person who focuses a lot of her study on the somatic dimensions of consciousness, 
I'd like to offer that part of our unraveling and part of our turning is also at the deeply somatic level. Som somatic. 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 S-O-M-A-T-I-C. The, the new field of somatics is basically understanding the perception of the human person from the first person perspective. Mm -hmm. the, the understanding and the claiming, the reclaim of indigenous understandings mm -hmm. that the, uh, the body at every level, cellular and non-material, is an intelligent field. So that when we move, when we unfold, all of the conditions that we unfold are also a reflection of what's happening in the, you know, the microcosm, macrocosm. Mm -hmm. So I would like to offer that our changes are not just cultural and spiritual, but there also is the somatic, the, the, the physical level of our own changing and that the more consciousness we can bring to that in terms of how we shape the story of disease and what it means, shape the story of health and what it means, and the polarization of those two things, I think is incredibly important because we're also, it is a time, as you very well know, of the increase of epidemics and other kinds of diseases. And if we bring that old religious story and the old models of the Western medical model to that story, I think once again, you will find yourself in a very uh, terrible predicament, so to speak. Yeah, I think this is also part of the, of the story of the, of, the inter <laughs> of the integral intelligence. And you know, part of what I've learned from uh, women biologists is the, the story of, of the intercommunication of our cells and the decision-making and intelligence that resides at every every level of every organism, including ourselves. And I, th I think it, it's an extraordinary story and, and very basic to expanding our understanding of, of our reality and our possibilities. Fantastic presentation, I just loved it. Um, I, it strikes me in America now, as we watch the uh, beginnings of the death throes of empire, that we are having a dialogue here in America of whether we can afford the time and the energy for justice and accountability. And I wanted to know where, what you thought about that, whether that was pivotal to our future stories here in America and the great turning, or whether you think that that would be a waste of uh, resources. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, I believe we need a dramatic change of leadership and, and we, I mean, it's a very serious issue here. You know, we passed over this, and I, you know, I, I made the observation that, that the institutions of empire tend to move to the highest levels of power, the most ethically challenged and power-driven among us. Now, I, we have a number of other questions, so I don't want to go into the details of the model that I use for, uh, for understanding the, the maturing of the individual human consciousness, but the basic, the basic point is that there are in our society some number of people who get stuck at the consciousness of a young child of between 6 and 12 years old, who's still caught up in a totally self-referential view of the world and is not yet truly capable of compassion, of acknowledging responsibility for one's own errors, and being able to look at a situation from the perspective of another person. Now, this happens to be the characteristic of some of our most powerful leaders. And it is not a laughing matter, <laughs> although, you know, we obviously have to laugh to maintain our sanity, but, <laughs> but it is very real. These are, you know, these are deeply psychologically handicapped people. <clears throat> and they fit, the pro they fit the profile of a sociopath. Now, I use that in relation to our, uh, to our institutions. Now, there's also another very interesting reality here that the, you know, those stories about our human nature, they define our nature in terms of the qualities of a sociopath or psychopath. 
we are told that's all we're capable of. Now, it's part of recognizing that's nonsense. At the same time, we need to recognize that people who exhibit those characteristics have absolutely no place in positions of power in society. And we need to... <laughs> You know, we need to recognize and face that. Um, these, these men, they're largely men, need to be under some kind of serious institutional care. <laughs> um, well, perhaps enough on that for the moment. Uh, our, our part of our challenge is that, is that the institutions and cultures of empire actively suppress the full realization of our human maturity. And that's part of our challenge. We've got to create societies. Perhaps this goes back to the idea of the need for reform in our schools. But we, you know, we need to create a whole set of, of social institutions um, that actually support every individual in realizing the full potentials of their consciousness. <clears throat> Thank you, David. It's a very, very nice presentation. Um, I'd like to point out one thing that you have put into this presentation that brings back a, an ethical dilemma for me personally, and probably for other people in this room. And that is that we're all part of a great system. We have the internet now, and that was responsible for organizing a lot of these people mm -hmm. that otherwise might not have gotten organized to go into the world, millions and millions of people, to try to tell us not to go to war in Iraq. Now, that is, to me, just a very prime example of what can happen regardless of what we say because we're not putting the power that we have in a democratic culture behind us to exercise that option to change things. We only went into the streets and exercised our freedom of speech. Most of us fortunately had that. But I want to pose to you a question that I've asked more than one person of notoriety and sometimes I don't always get a straight answer. And it's a very volatile question, and it concerns everyone in this room. It concerns you, it concerns me. And we can, because we have the power. We are responsible, basically, for supporting the greatest power the Earth has ever seen, including all of the ugliness and all of the raw, unbridled destruction that it puts out in order to get its way for the corporations or what have you. But the bottom line is the power that we have as individuals to object to do something, to move, to exercise the power that we have. And everybody in this room, I'm sure, is at one time or another pay, paid federal income taxes. We pay taxes, not just federal income taxes, we pay all sorts of taxes, but the federal income tax is largely responsible for the greatest amount of money that makes this great steamroller or meat grinder go forward in the world. Whether we like it or not, we're a part of the madness of the machine. What would you suggest we do about that? <laughs> well, we obviously face a great dilemma about, uh, about our taxes. I do believe that we need government. We need government at all levels, and government needs to be financed. Um, now, you know, one of, the, one of the arguments of the far right is that we should do away with government. Of course, they don't really want to do away with it. They only want to do away with those that aspects that support, um, you know, support people. You know, if, if, well, I, I, I don't have a position on whether or not to pay one's income tax. I mean, the, the um, because I, you know, the, the Bush, you know, the, the, the administrations in power have, have accomplished quite a remarkable thing by making government so obnoxious, so inefficient, so destructive that they, they have us on the progressive side asking questions about whether we should join the revolt against paying taxes. Um, and I think most of us believe that there is a necessary and appropriate role for government. Taxes are necessary to do that. Um, I do happen to believe in an income tax, particularly a progressive income tax that puts the burden on those people who have gained the most from society and have the greatest ability to pay. So I'm very reluctant to, to put forward categorical suggestions that we should stop paying our taxes because it... Yeah, well we certainly, you know, we certainly have a need for political actions, no question about that. And we need to, you know, we need to, to be doing all the things to insist that our government use our tax money in ways that are beneficial to society rather than actively destructive. 
And of course, it gets back to our earlier question of getting, uh, getting those folks now in office, out of office. Uh, and I think I am, I am a lot more interested in getting them out of office. We certainly need to expose their crimes as part of our national, uh, uh, national education. But in terms of vindictive punishment, uh, I, I guess I would be inclined to, our energy may be better spent elsewhere. Jim, you just did the perfect segue for me. Uh, I've been involved in war tax resistance for years, mm -hmm. and um, it's very difficult because the punishment, you end up paying more to the government um, than you would have otherwise. But you can withhold a portion. You can write a check to, the, to human services. There's a lot of things you can do. But we do have, I want to thank you, David, for rallying my community here, getting everybody here, so that I can ask them a question, which is, we do, the, Jim's uh, comment about our money and our personal power is totally, um, we, there are a lot of things that we can do with our money that don't cost us um, a lot of extra money that save us money and keep our money in the community. So I would ask everybody um, to change the story, challenge you and all of us to change the Christmas story. It's coming up. We can change the story. You don't, we don't have to buy into the commercial, industrial, military, complex version of uh, consumerism for Christmas. Stop participating. Yes. Don't shop at Costco and Walmart and don't buy Christmas presents. Do your stuff locally here in this community. Yes. Keep your money in action. Yes. Okay? How many of you came here on a bicycle tonight? <laughs> okay? Come on, get out of your cars. Yes. Walk, bike. Bus. Okay? You got it? It's up to us. If we're going to change it, we have to change it. I'm just very pragmatic. Yeah. <laughs> Helen, I work with Helen in Ladakh. Yeah. And oh, good. She calls me a primitive. Hel Helen. I'm a primitive. I'm a minimalist. And I okay. invite you all to divest sure. from this consumer uh, society. <laughs> Shop with your local independent businesses and buy local products whenever you can. Um, I am conscious, though. I mean, your your comment about bicycling. I'm also very conscious that uh, you know most of us live in situations where you probably couldn't have gotten here on a bicycle. And I moved from a place where I couldn't. Well, that's a that's a possibility, but we okay. If you. This, you know, this deals with a set of larger, uh, larger choices. I mean, there, there's a deeper, there's a deeper point here. Um, we each need to be responsible on individual choices, but we also need to be very conscious of our land use issues and how we, how we use space collectively, and how that determines our opportunities for walking, bicycling, and using public transit. And most of the layout of our land in most parts of the country is laid out so you can virtually do nothing without getting in a car, given most places that people are available to live in. And, and that's part of another, another piece of the discussion that we need to get forward. And it's partly where we need to really organize locally and begin to take control of these things. And I, you know, I understand you've had this terribly unfortunate situation here of some people out to destroy community you know, lied and got through a, 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 an initiative that makes it virtually impossible to control land use. And I think that, you know, that's a major, you, you know what I'm talking about, the, yeah. Um, you know, I, I hope that there's gonna be a major mobilization here to, uh, to, to reverse that with a new initiative. Very, very important. It's, you know, when I first, became aware of how the, uh, you know, how these structural adjustment programs and the, the pushing of the neoliberal agenda around the world, the, 
you know, taking away tariffs, uh, privatizing uh, all you know, public resources, uh, doing away with public services and so forth. As I heard my colleagues in the International Forum on Globalization talk about how that was playing out around the world, I thought, my God, these people are out dismantling society. Dismantling the whole sense of connection, the glue, that we are more than just simply a collection of isolated individuals. And of course, that particular measure that went through is part of that mentality. It completely ignores the reality that none of us are in this game alone. And we can only survive and prosper together in, in ways that are responsible. And it includes, I, you know, I'm a believer in private property. I think it's so important everybody should have some. It's a foundation of democracy. But we also need to redefine our whole concept of private property. It's not a license to do anything you want. It is, it is a responsibility, a stewardship, and it must be used responsibly with an understanding that we are, we are the caretakers and need to pass it on to our children in better condition than we found it. Next. Well, the, uh, the piece that gave me the most uh, thrill from your presentation was the notion of, uh, of community. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think uh, from a very young age I had an understanding that we live in a very crazy paradigm where everyone's out for themselves and that just can't work. I've known that forever. Mm -hmm. So thanks for, you know, for, uh, for uh, letting me hear that again. Uh, but uh, on the, the same token, I'm uh, 50 years old and, I, and, I'm, and I'm not living in community. Mm -hmm. uh, even though I've known this all my life and uh, I find it very good difficult to let go of all of those securities uh, that are actually a sinking ship. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to let go and to move on and to, and I thank this woman for uh, examples that, of how to let go by degrees at least. Um, question. Um, I've also been politically active my, for a long, long time and speaking out about what I see going on, what our government's doing. Um, one of those things and, uh, is, is, is the empire story around what happened on 9-11. Um, I think it's, it's a, pretty much a myth and a fallacy, mm -hmm. and there's a, there's a whole lot more to be seen there. Um, but, um, my question, though, is, is <laughs> okay. I, have, I have one. Get to the question. The question is um, that in my, my, I give a lot of my life's energy to exposing things like that and educating around those things, and I often, at the same time, wonder what good I'm doing. Uh, so there's a difference between um, uh, fighting what I see as wrong or trying to right what's wrong and bring out that truth. And, and, um, on one hand, and on the other hand, forming the good or the, the new paradigm. So I'm kind of, uh, or maybe they're both, I don't know, are, are the right things to be doing. So that's kind of my question. <laughs> did you hear a question there? Uh, yeah, did anybody pick up a question there? <laughs> well, there, there's a, on, on one hand, there's, on, on one hand, there's uh, being politically active and exposing empire yeah. or its evils that it's doing, or there is building the new, mm -hmm. and so I'm often torn between those two. They're and both, they're both. Oh, yeah. they're both. Okay, no question. <laughs> Let me just say a little bit about the, uh, the security issue and, and, and letting go. Um, you know, part of the serious dilemma that we're in is, is we have dismantled the community support system. It leaves us each individually, uh, you know, dependent on our own, own resources, including our financial resources. Um, and we, you know, the ultimate security comes from community, period. I think, you know, to me, one of the very interesting issues that demonstrates this is the issue of social security. And of course, you know, we face this effort to, uh, to privatize social security. We're told we'll all be a whole lot better off if we uh, just put our money and savings away that would otherwise go into social security and uh, uh, we'll have more money and we'll have a better retirement. Now, you think about that. 
None of us knows how long we will live. None of us knows what our medical needs will be. Nobody knows how much our portfolio will grow or shrink. Nobody knows what the inflation rate will be. You know, I looked at a financial magazine that was trying to offer some help on a calculation, figure out how much money you need for a retirement at a particular level. In the end, they gave up. They couldn't do it. You know, probably you have to have several million dollars. Well, that can work for a few people. It obviously can't work for everybody. You know, the ultimate, you know, it's, it's coming back and recognizing that the whole thing ultimately is, is necessarily an insurance problem. We have to deal with it collectively. We have to all agree that we're going to support each other and, you know, and out of that pool we will uh, uh, address the needs of, uh, of, of you know, how, however it plays out. And it's the same thing in terms of more generally. I want to suggest that we stop the line. I will, who, where, where is the end of the line? There is an end? Or, or, are, you guys, are you folks in line back there? Or you're, no, okay. So you're the end of the line? Okay, let's, let's cut it off there and I'll, we'll, we'll go through the rest of the line and uh, um, I'll try to respond as best I can. This is a thank you and it's a suggestion. Um, the thank you is I, I appreciate your reaffirming progressive values and life-giving values and uh, rallying caring people. The suggestion, or two suggestions really, are that you, um, in future writing and in future talks, um, address strategy more specifically, address solutions, and in particular, the two main obstacles that I see to this making a big t uh, turning, great turning, are um, corporate media, number one, and number two, um, the election system. Cor corporate media, um, the reason that that is a big deal, of course, is because over 90% of Americans get their information and their views of the world are through the corporate media, and so we can't achieve a massive turning of everybody, you know, leaving their cars, etc., if we don't get at least a majority behind it. We can't without, you know, the corporate media is not going to support that, so that's a big problem. But I don't see a way around, so I'm hoping you do. Um, okay. The second one is the election system. Um, I don't think a lot of people realize, but our, our election system, um, our ballots and everything have been counted ultimately by the National, National Election Service since the 1950s. And that is a conglomerate of ABC, NBC, CBS, and AP. It's a conglomerate of corporations. That's who ultimately has, for over 50 years, been counting our ballots and ultimately reporting them. And that, that's back when they started reporting them on the spot on the minute as soon as the polls closed, which isn't, it isn't, isn't possible to do that. Um, Those are exit polls, not the counting of the ballots. A, a lot of places turn their, turn their results immediately. Um, but anyway, you know, look into that. Uh, Votescam.com has a whole lot of information. Yeah. That, and really, people should read the first two chapters if they Okay, those are both, both important there. areas. Uh, obviously, yeah. Um, well, I'll underscore that. The one I want to, I mean, obviously, I, I did refer to elections and election reform and uh, uh, didn't go into detail, but, uh, you know, count the votes. You may recall that. <laughs> Um, I think that's a sound suggestion. In terms of the media, one of the, th um, I think media, ref you know, work on media reform is extremely important, but I think we should not allow ourselves to become immobilized by the fact that, uh, that, that there are elements of the media that are totally under corporate control. We have seen deep changes come in societies around the world, by, you know, driven by people who did not have access to the, the official media. Um, and we can communicate. I mean, the, you know, uh, Gandhi brought independence to India without controlling the, uh, the British press. Um, you know, the apartheid, apartheid fell in South Africa without the, uh, the black South, South Africans having any particular access to the press. We have all kinds of media mechanisms for communication, including gatherings like this, the internet, or independent media, and so forth. So it's important to not let ourselves get immobilized by the, uh, uh, the corporate media juggernaut. 
I mean, one of the things that I find a great tragedy is the difficulty that young people have today in terms of the limitations of opportunities that we just took for granted in my generation when we were your age. And of course, it's all part of the process of, of restructuring the economy to concentrate more wealth and power in the hands of a small, wealthy elite. And one of the greatest challenges that we have, I mean, ultimately, uh, if we're going to get out of this mess we're in, we have to radically redistribute the wealth of the planet, both more equitably among people and also away from the pernicious uses for military and so forth to things that actually support people and their, their daily needs. Now, one of the things that I put a lot of my energy into is the, is the economic transformation, which focuses on building local living economies getting back control of our economies so that we can use our resources and our economies to create good living wage jobs so everybody has an opportunity and developing our own resources, our farming, our uh, energy sources and so forth to begin to create, recreate local economies that have some integrity and are devoted to meeting real needs. And I hope that that is part of the solution to your issue. Now, I suspect you may also be, uh, part of your question may relate to the fact you're, what, you're creating a nonprofit and you need, uh, you need some sources of contributions from people who may have more wealth in the community. Now perhaps you might want to organize a conversation with some other members of the community specifically around your, uh, around your question and what it, what it would mean for the community. I want to say in closing that I have found this an extraordinary evening the energy in this room, the creativity, the commitment is indeed an inspiration that I will carry with me. And I look forward, I hope the opportunity to come back and join you again sometime. And I'll be going out to sign books and uh, look forward to seeing many of you out there. I'll be happy to sign a book for you. Thank you. RVML Resource Center is a volunteer-operated federal 501c3 tax-exempt nonprofit organization. RVML is dedicated to providing easy access to a comprehensive collection of information on a variety of metaphysical, spiritual, and personal development subjects. RVML accepts and appreciates all donations. Material and monetary contributions are fully tax-deductible. This recording is not copyrighted and permission is granted to broadcast, exhibit, or duplicate all or part of this program for non-commercial educational purposes. This live presentation was organized and presented by the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library and Event Center. For more information, please visit rvml.org.